Uh, when I was a kid, I loved playing with Legos. Uh, my brothers and I, we built a whole a Lego metropolis. We had those little thin uh, Lego road mats that we stuck together. We filled our Lego city with uh, houses and, and, and businesses <laughs> that we built out of all of our Lego pieces. Uh, we even held events in our Lego city, like the Lego City Grand Tour, where all the little Lego people came to watch me and my brothers race the Lego vehicles that we had built all across the city. And if my memory serves me, I'm pretty sure I won most of those races. Uh, but there was one Lego creation uh, that I loved more than all of the rest. My tower. My tower. This, this one didn't come in a box. Uh, this one didn't have any instructions. It was uh, a creation of my own design. Man, I love that tower. I know it's hard to see with my angelic face there, but uh, I'll tell you what, that kid, he loved that tower. But do you know what inevitably happened to that tower? That, that tall, fragile Lego tower standing in the middle of three preteen boys playing in a basement? You know what happened. It got wrecked <laughs> multiple times. All my hard work undone. Has that ever happened to you? You poured your, your time and energy and effort into something just to watch it unravel before your eyes? I don't know how you felt in that moment, if that's happened to you, but I went through a few, a few stages. Uh, resolve. Okay, things happen, right? Life happens. I can, I can fix this. I can rebuild this. And sure enough, my Lego tower, it, it stood again, probably even bigger and taller than, than that picture. Uh, anger. Okay, <laughs> I've had it, right? The second or third time that thing fell down, I probably went on a rampage against whichever brother had knocked it down and said, you know what, if my stuff's getting wrecked, your stuff's going to get wrecked too. But the fifth, sixth, seventh time, I think just despair. You know, would I ever be able to really enjoy my Lego tower? I, I don't know. I, eventually, it, it didn't get built again. I gave up. My work was left undone. Undone. Well, that could very well serve as a, a chapter heading for Nehemiah chapter 13. Undone. Everything that we've been uh, building up to in this uh, rubble restoration story uh, starts to unravel in this final chapter. Each major construction that took place in each wave. Remember, right, in this story, we have journeyed with those exiled Israelites back from Babylon to Jerusalem in three different waves. There was uh, the first wave in 539 B.C., led by Zerubbabel. Uh, he came back and he rebuilt the temple. Then there was the second wave in 458 B.C., led by Ezra, uh, he came back and rebuilt the, the spiritual foundations of the people, right? He, he taught them the Torah, the law, the story of God, and he recruited a bunch of workers for the temple. And the final wave came with Nehemiah in 445 B.C., and uh, his big deal was the walls, right? That's what he came to restore and to rebuild in Jerusalem. And each time they completed one of these big projects, there was worship and celebration, praising God, right, rejoicing. There was a lot of excitement in this story that we've been reading with all these things completed. And, and things, by this point in the story, they were actually so good that Nehemiah, he went back to Persia, back to serve the king as cupbearer, uh, to fulfill the promise that he had made to the king all the way back in chapter 2. But when Nehemiah took a visit 
back to Jerusalem. Well, well, that was our text for today. There he was, right? Strolling through the streets of Jerusalem. And what did he see? People treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and, and all kinds of loads on the Sabbath day. A Sabbath day was supposed to be a day of rest for the people. They had actually vowed to rest from their work on the Sabbath day so that they could remember their God, Yahweh, and all the things that He had done for them, all the good that He had done for His people. But these people are going around like, none of that's important. Like, like worshiping God is kind of a waste of time. I mean, really, isn't there something better I could be doing with my time? That's what these people are doing. But Nehemiah, he knows exactly where that will lead the people. He knows exactly where that's going to lead them, so he calls them out. We heard it in our text. He said, what is this evil thing that you are doing? Profaning the Sabbath day. Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster upon us and upon this city, Jerusalem? Remember <laughs> the exile? The thing we've been trying to come back from, the city we've been trying to rebuild? Don't you remember that it was this very thing, this distraction from God, forgetting about Him, that led to our destruction? Oh, come on, guys, what are you thinking? Ezra, Ezra had worked hard to rebuild the spiritual foundations of the people, but they were starting to come undone. But Nehemiah, Nehemiah, he was resolved for these changes to stick, and so he rebuked the people. Now, just before this, Nehemiah, well, he had taken a stroll past the temple. And what did he find in the temple? Well, I'll tell you what he didn't find. He didn't find any Levites. There were no church workers. They had all fled to their fields. They had all fled because no one had been giving to the church. No one had been tithing. The temple was financially uh, not solvent. Uh, the workers were actually starting to starve, so they, they did left. To, to fend for themselves in their own field. And to top it all off, the room where they were supposed to hold those offerings that kept the, the priesthood going and the Levites fed and nourished, that room had been turned into a master suite by one of the priest's buddies, Tobiah, who was actually the same guy who was, who was giving opposition to Nehemiah early on in our stories when he was trying to rebuild the walls. You could just see Nehemiah's blood start to boil when he sees this. That, that vein, you know, in his head starts to bulge. You've probably seen it at some point on your mom or dad, right? That thing is about to blow. And, and Nehemiah, he takes Tobiah and all his furniture and he, he throws them out like Jazzy J in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Ah! <laughs> The temple, Zerubbabel's work, that took 23 years to complete, undone, starting to become undone. But it's really the last bit that, that puts Nehemiah over the edge. He's not strolling anymore. His, his stroll has turned into kind of a, a full-fledged march, right? His neck is tense, his teeth are clenched as he starts to ascend his walls. Remember, that was Nehemiah's big shtick, right? His, his walls. And, and when he climbs up, what does he see? Merchants and sellers of all kinds lodged outside Jerusalem, right outside of his walls on the Sabbath day. Not my walls! He clenches his fists and breathes out threats upon the merchants. But it's the next day 
but he really loses it. When he encounters more intermarriage, more people forsaking uh, the law and, and their covenant vows to God and, and really just not caring at all about their faith. And he says, says this in Scripture, he says, I confronted them and cursed them and beat them and pulled some of their hair out. And I made them take an oath in the name of God. Strike three. And Nehemiah's out. He goes on a full-fledged rampage, really. Furious that all of his work is coming undone. And then? Well, then the book just ends. Just like that. Actually, the book finishes with just one little closing prayer where Nehemiah basically says, Look, God, at least I tried. Remember me for that. And then that's it. The book is done. It's kind of a weird ending, right? I mean, after all the building and restoring that Ezra and Nehemiah uh, was filled with, the restoring that those prophets had spoke of and that seemed to be coming true in their time, to end like this on such a downer. It's odd. Well, maybe, maybe it's not, because this isn't a Hollywood story. This is scripture. This is reality. Maybe it's actually relatable. Maybe you can think of a time, a time when something was coming undone, in your life. Maybe a time right now where something is coming undone. We all know what it's like to see things unravel, collapse, come undone in our lives. Whether it's a, a Lego tower or something much more significant. How many times have you seen your own efforts in your workplace or, or in your school seem to fall short. And not for lack of trying, right? You, you put in a good effort. You poured out your, your blood, sweat, and tears into that project. But it still wasn't good enough. It still was subpar, under the bar, and in all of your energy and effort, it felt like it just it came undone. Or maybe it's a relationship could be your spouse, significant other. could be a friend or a sibling or a, a child. You poured yourself into the relationship. You wanted to build a relationship with them. Get close. Be there for them. And you were, right? You, you were there for them when times were hard. You pushed through, you fought for them, but, but life still brought circumstances in that you didn't expect. And all your efforts on behalf of this person that you loved unraveled, undone. What are we supposed to do? Based on Nehemiah, what's, what's his message? Are we supposed to be like Nehemiah? When life hits us like this, just... Just work up some more resolve. Fight back. When life hits us, just, just hit back harder, regardless of the damage that's done to anybody else. Is the point that we need to force the conclusion that we want? Or is Nehemiah trying to show us something different? You know, some people treat the book of Nehemiah that way, like a self-help book. Some people treat the whole Bible that way. But that's not what those stories are about. The Bible doesn't communicate to us by offering simple answers and moral examples to follow. 
the characters that fill these Bible stories are deeply flawed and often ambiguous, a mixed bag of successes and failures, just like us. Nehemiah was a flawed person, like you, like me. There were things in his life that he was trying to build, and they were good things, like so many of the things that we strive to build in our lives. And Nehemiah, he even took his cues from God, right? He, he prayed to God. He asked God for direction. He even listened to the prophets. But what he experienced at the end of his story was that we can't ultimately will things to happen in this life. God is God, and we are not. We're human. And sometimes, despite our best efforts, things simply come undone. I mean, we live in a world of entropy, Aaron said it earlier in her confession, it's pretty messed up. It's a world where everything breaks down. And we call the root cause of that sin. It's infected our world. It's infected your life, my life. It's infected your heart and my heart. Nehemiah longed to see that prophetic image come true, the one that we heard Jeremiah talking about. He wanted Israel to experience that rest that they sought after. Hebrew word, sabbath, the Sabbath. Nehemiah wanted them to live out the promise of God when, when God said, again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O Israel, O virgin Israel. Let that identity sink in for a second. After all Israel had done, God calls him virgin Israel. But what Nehemiah didn't realize was that the real fulfillment of that prophecy would not come by his efforts, but by God's efforts. That prophecy would not be fulfilled until God himself would step down and enter back into his creation with his own two feet. And that's the point of the Bible. It all points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus, to the one who would not simply bring peace on earth, bring rest, but the one who is himself our peace and our rest. We heard it say it himself in the gospel. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You don't need to resolve to, 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 to hunker deep down and find your grit, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't need to get angry and to force whatever it is you want to come true. And Jesus invites, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Nehemiah teaches us that even when we're undone, God's not done. God's not done. He wasn't done with Nehemiah. God would bring that rest to his people Israel. Things didn't end with Nehemiah because God would bring a greater builder. He would send his own son to rebuild what was truly broken, humanity, the human heart, the problem behind all the problems, sin. And Jesus would fix it all. Just a couple of nails. The Bible teaches that even when you're undone, God is not done. Things didn't end for Nehemiah in Israel, and things are not over for you. 
Jesus is still at work seeking to rebuild you. And all that is broken in you and in your life. Whatever it is that seems to keep falling apart, take it to Jesus. Come to me and I will give you rest. Whatever you've been trying to build in your life that you have just seen collapse, come to me, and I will give you rest. If today you're just feeling tired and worn out and ragged and just at the end of your rope, if you're, if you're feeling undone, come to me, and I will give you rest. We talk a lot in this sermon series about all the things that, that we're excited for here at St. Peter and Paul. We, we find ourselves in a building season two like Ezra and Nehemiah and we're excited about it. But even if those things don't get done, if they become undone, God's not done. Even if all our hopes and dreams and plans for our new Sunday school hour and, and a new worship service and a new garage, even if it all comes undone, God's not done. Because God is still building His kingdom here on earth in His time, in His way, according to His plans, for God is God. And we are not. He is the master builder and nothing can stop him from rebuilding what he has promised to build. One day, even you and I will be rubble, and literally, will be dust. All of our work, all of our efforts, dust. Our bodies, dead, <laughs> decomposed, dust. Even that, Jesus has promised to restore and rebuild. Again, I will build you. Jesus says to you, no matter where you are at today, again, I will build you, and you shall be built. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, our lives are rubble. Sometimes they get going okay and things are built up and, and we're excited about the things that you are building in our lives. But we give thanks and we praise you for, for the things that are whole, for the shalom that we have. But we know that that's not always the story. Sometimes things come undone. But we know that you're building we know that you have made us for yourself, Jesus, and that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Restore us, Jesus. Rebuild us. Give us rest in your name. Amen.